and I would like to invite one of the editors of the book, Aditi Banerjee, to come and introduce the book and the issue. And a little note on her. Aditi Banerjee received a BA in International Relations from Tuft University and a doctorate in law for, from Yale Law School. Her publications include The Hyphenated Hindus in Outlook India, Hindu American, both sides of the hyphen, and a chapter in the book Buddhists, Hindus, and Sikhs in America. And this was done by Oxford University Press. So she's been very modest. She hasn't written much more about this, but she's, she's uh, very fiery in her writings, very logical, and a very important practicing lawyer in America. So Aditi, please come. Namaste. Thank you, Shruti, for those kind words. What I'd like to talk about today is how I became involved with this book, Invading the Sacred, an analysis of Hinduism studies in America, and why I think this book matters, not just to me personally, but to us all. I'd like to begin with uh, three short vignettes of how this, how this kind of scholarship has affected me and people like me. When I was in high school, my American history teacher, for no discernible reason, read to the class a newspaper clipping about an airplane that had accidentally landed in a remote Indian coastal village. The article described how the villagers rushed to Garland, the plane, and the pilot. The students and my teacher laughed uproariously at the ignorance of these villagers, or what they mistook to be ignorance, who saw an ordinary airplane and a pilot for, as gods. At that age, I did not have the words or the wherewithal to explain to them that Indians honor anything and anyone that enters their home for the first time. It is customary for Indians to garland honored guests, for example, or to place a dot of vermilion powder on new purchases. This does not mean we regard these objects or persons necessarily as God. Rather, such gestures express our gratitude and respect for them, as well as the divine for bringing them to us. Later on, in college in America, I was exposed to Jeffrey Kripal's theory of Sri Ramakrishna being a homosexual who had homoerotic feelings about and possibly abused Swami Vivekananda. It was presented to me not as speculation, but as an academically established and authoritative truth. All my life, I looked upon Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda as saints who had revived Hinduism during colonial rule in India. I had a picture of Sri Ramakrishna and Sharada Devi to which I daily offered arati, and I eagerly read Swami Vivekananda's complete works. I felt shaken by these academic allegations. Instinctively, I knew such claims were baseless and wrong, but yet these claims were made, by, made and vouched for by authoritative scholars with Ivy League credentials, so they could not be completely wrong, could they? Further on at work in my law practice in New York, I chose to wear a bindi as a mark of auspiciousness. Though some family members and friends warned me that my colleagues may find such a mark to be repugnant or primitive, my belief and experience was that Ameri my fellow Americans were an open-minded people and that I would face no such problems. However, I then came across Professor David Gordon Wright's book, Kiss of the Yogini, Tantric Sex in its South Asian Context, in which he remarks that the bindi, is a represent, the bindi that a Hindu woman wears represents a drop of menstrual blood. At that point, I grew apprehensive, wondering if the bindi would be seen as some primitive, literally bloodthirsty rite. But still, I wear it e every day, even though I do wonder sometimes, when catching the surreptitious, curious stares of others, what exactly they think of it, and whether that perception has been shaped by the speculation of renowned scholars such as Professor White. Because my Indian friends and I have experienced such attitudes towards my religion, usually in the subtlest of ways, and because we have never had the voice or the ammunition with which to fire back to say that these claims are baseless and untruthful, I was delighted to accept the opportunity to become involved with this book. For what starts in American universities does not remain there. It spreads globally, per percolates through to mainstream culture, to primary and secondary schools, and to the way ordinary citizens interact with and react to each other. 
The academic stereotyping of Hinduism as grotesque and over-sexualized harms the serious study of its shastras. The demonology of modern acharyas and gurus embarrasses an entire generation of budding scholars, preventing them to, to, from independently engaging with their works. And when our most cherished deities and traditions are exoticized or sensationalized, we are tempted to abandon those traditions and forms of Hinduism that make us Hindu. I would like to give a few examples of the types of academic misrepresentations that are having this kind of effect. The scholarship being critiqued in this book involves a pattern of Freudian psychoanalyses that sensationalize, eroticize, exoticize, and distort the meanings of sacred Hindu figures, deities, and traditions. Our book analyzes several such case studies, and here are some illustrative examples. This is a quote from Professor Wendy Doniger, Professor of History and Religion at the University of Chicago, past president of, Amer of the American Ac Academy of Religion and Association for Asian Studies, and an award-winning author of numerous books on Hinduism. She has said in her now withdrawn entry in Microsoft and Carta, that Holi, the spring carnival, when members of all castes mingle and let down their hair, sprinkling one another with cascades of red powder and liquid, that was symbolic of the blood that was probably used in past centuries. She has also said that the Bhagavad Gita is not as nice a book as some Americans think. Throughout the Mahabharat, Krishna goads human beings into all sorts of murderous and self-destructive behaviors such as war. In concluding that the Gita is a dishonest book, it justifies war. Then we move on to Jeffrey Kripal, professor of religious studies and chair of the Department of Religious Studies at Rice University who wrote a book which won the Best Book Award from the American Academy of Religion and was listed by Encyclopedia Britannica as its top choice for learning about Sri Ramakrishna. This book claims that the mystical experiences of saints like Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda were the result of sexual abuse and sexual confusion. Here is a direct quote. These homoerotic energies, in other words, not only shaped the symbolism of Ramakrishna's mysticism, they were his mysticism. Let me be very clear. Without the conflicted energies of the saint's homosexual desires, there would have been no Kali sword, no unconscious handmaid, no conflict between the mother and the lover, no child, no Radha, no living lingam, no naked Paramahamsa boys, no Jesus state, no love body, no ecstatically extended feet, no closing and opening doors, no symbolic visions, no Pava and no Samadhi. In effect, there would have been no Ramakrishna. Moving on, we go to Professor Paul Courtright, Professor of Religion and Asian Studies and former Chair of the Department of Religion and Asian Studies at Emory University, who wrote a book on Ganesha which won the History of Religions Award. Here are some choice excerpts. Ganesha's trunk is the displaced phallus, a caricature of Shiva's linga. It poses no threat because it is too large, flaccid, and in the wrong place to be useful for sexual purposes. Ganesha remains celibate so as not to compete erotically with his father, who is a notorious womanizer, either incestuously for his mother, Parvati, or for any other woman for that matter. Both in his behavior and iconographic form, <coughs> Ganesha resembles in some aspects the figure of the eunuch. Ganesha is like a eunuch guarding the women of the harem. Let me be very clear. These works are objectionable not because they're grossly offensive, but because they are based on flimsy, unsubstantiated, and often non-existent evidence. Such failings have been pointed out by fellow academics, including both Hindus and non-Hindus, as well as non-Indians, but their challenges have gone completely unanswered and have never been addressed by these scholars. These detailed scholarly critiques, among others, are reprinted or summarized in our book. In order to understand what drives such scholarship, we need to view this phenomenon not as isolated incidents of excess and error, but as part of a larger trend that has spanned many decades and many disciplines. As we show in our book, not much has changed in this field of scholarship from Berkeley Hill's 1921 essay entitled The Anal Erotic Factor in the Religion, Philosophy, and Character of the Hindus, which posited that Hindu reverence for Agni, Indra, and Surya evidenced a fascination for passing gas as these deities are associated with wind, that Vedic chants emulated the act of passing gas, and that Atman was really a pseudo-metaphysical facade for the Hindu flatus complex. 
This is not just something in the distant past. Today, such a reading is echoed by David Gordon White's reduction of Tantra to an upper caste intellectual whitewash of lower caste sexual practices wherein sacred mantras are nothing more than nonsense syllables from the inart inarticulate moans made, during, made by women during sexual intercourse. This scholarship is not the product of a few idle and perhaps disturbed minds, but rather a narrative driven by deeply embedded civilizational worldviews. Over time, I learned how a coterie of academic scholars is targeting that which is most sacred and renowned in Hinduism. The Bhagavad Gita, Bhakti, Yoga, deities such as Sri Ganesha, Shiva, and Devi, spiritual leaders like Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, and deconstructing them either as being pathological or as not Hindu at all. This is the invasion of the sacred, the looting of a living religion, an entire spiritual and cultural tradition by denigration and by appropriation. Because Hinduism is one of the few remaining major world religions that is non-Abrahamic, and because it is the source of the great traditions of Buddhism, Sikhism, and Jainism, it is unique, and given the history of similar native religions, one that is under severe attack. Through the invasions of its sacred, both in the physical realm, through the historical colonization of India, and now in the intellectual and cultural realms through ongoing Eurocentric scholarship, its philosophical, cultural, and spiritual capital has been and continues to be destroyed and appropriated. Therefore, we believe that American academic scholarship regarding Hinduism deserves special scrutiny and sensitivity. Our critics falsely claim that we are engaged in censorship. But in fact, we must point out that we do not seek to silence the voices of those critique. We only ask that other voices be added to the ongoing discourse about Hinduism, and therefore we seek to promote multiculturalism and a diversity of view, and not academic censorship. We believe that outsider perspectives do offer value in understanding any religion, including Hinduism, but that emic or insider perspectives are just as vital and valuable. It is our hope that this book will help open up the space and inspire a new generation of thinkers to engage with, question, and interpret with fresh eyes our cultural and religious traditions, to explore how the oldest forms of Indian philosophy can pave new ways of thinking, and to enable us to engage with other traditions and cultures, not through intellectual invasions, but through constructive dialogue and debate. Thank you.